Hello learners and welcome to my session on identifying learning gaps in EVS, making use of investigative test. My name is Russell D'Souza and I am from Nirmala Institute of Education, Goa. So the structure will be as follows. We will first look at uh, the EVS indicators followed by the meaning of a learning gap, followed by the concept of investigative test and we close with the idea of types of investigative test. So if you look at the indicators of uh, EVS, this suggests that a learner should be able to do several things. For instance, he should be able to observe and report. When I say this, I mean the child should be able to explore, share, narrate, draw. He should be able to read pictures, interpret pictures. He should be able to collect information, record information, read tables, read maps. Map reading is, is a very important skill for children because today we talk about maps a lot in our daily life. The second one is discussion. So the child should be able to listen, should be able to talk, express. He should be able to express his opinions. He should be able to find out. The third one is expression. That is, the child should be able to use his body to express his thoughts, his feelings, his ideas. Uh, he should be able to express verbally. He should be able to express to the use of drawings. For example, uh, we are looking at uh, different animals. So the child should be able to express his idea through drawings. So why does an elephant have large flappy ears? He should be able to write. Then we also talk about ability of a learner to classify. So classification based on certain observable features of objects. Like uh, you have different vegetables. So based on the observable features, they would categorize these as you know, this is this type of vegetable, this is this type, and so on and so forth. Similarly, it can be with flowers, it can be with any objects that they interact with. They should be able to question. And when I say question, they should be able to ask those critical questions at times. For example, um, um, uh, why is it that we have to brush our teeth on a regular basis? What is the need? You know, parents say you should brush your teeth, but why? What is the need? They should be able to frame proper questions. For example, why, what, where, how. Um, they should be able to express their curiosity. And when I say expressing their curiosity, if I give you an illustration, so uh, how is it possible for the peacher plant to survive? They should be able to analyze given situations. Uh, they should be able to make certain predictions. Or they should be able to formulate their hypothesis, test them. They should be able to, you know, conduct small, tiny experiments. Um, a very important thing and a very important skill is the concern for justice and equality. It is not enough that we look at cognition. We also need to look very carefully at the effective dimension because that dimension helps us to live, you know, in a social world, in an emotional world. It teaches us to interact with people and to live with people, um, or, you know, with uh, different temperaments, in different environments. And the last skill that we are going to look at is cooperation. That is the ability of the child to take an initiative. I want to do this. I would like to do it this way. A child to sh who shares his work with others, who also displays empathy. So, what do all these things tell us teachers? It tells us something. So what does it tell us? It tells us teachers that we as teachers need to create opportunities through the content that we teach them to observe, to measure, to classify, to categorize, to express, to discuss, to think, to deliberate, to question to reason, to analyze, and most important, to appreciate and value, to respect. When I say appreciate, value, respect, respect our family members, respect relationships, 
respect nature around us, respect plants and animals, the food that we eat. So we learn to appreciate value things. So what drives the teaching of the content? Well, it's a stated learning outcomes. We know that learning outcomes are statements which tell us what a learner will be able to do. That is, what will he demonstrate at the end of instruction. This means that the learning outcomes must be specific, they should be measurable, they should be achievable, they should be realistic and time focused. And so we coin an abbreviation S-M-A-R-T, SMART. So we say that the learning outcomes should be SMART. So clearly stated learning outcomes will give us direction on how to go about with our teaching and also tell us how we should go about assessing what we have taught. Now, we come to a very important concept and that is what is a learning gap? Now, as teachers, we are expected to regularly assess a learner. This may happen at the, as the unit is in progress or at the end of a unit or chapter or it may also happen at the end of a semester. So, a teacher would administer an achievement test. That is, you know, an achievement test are the regular classroom tests that teachers prepare and administer. So, a teacher would administer such a test to determine what the learner has learned or what the child has achieved. Consider, for example, the following learning outcomes. The pupil will learn about plants. And uh, the specific learning outcomes there are states that plants differ from each other, categorizes stems of plants as thick or thin, tells that leaves differ in color, shape, size, smell, and also the leaf margins. That means the child is exposed to this entire content. But now when the teacher goes into the phase of assessment and the teacher, you know, may ask a child a question, uh, cite examples of those plants that have a thick stem and the child may not be able to do it. Or for that matter, the teacher may say, cite examples of plants that have very thin flimsy stems and the child would tell. Or the child would identify a given plant, uh, identify a plant based on the leaf. Or uh, maybe a child may identify the plant based on the leaf margins when he sees it, or maybe on the smell, or maybe on the size, or maybe on the shape. So, the assessment results will definitely show us that some students excel, whereas there are some students who may not even achieve the minimum expected learning outcomes. So, here comes a leg. There is a difference. And this difference we call a gap in learning. So, a learning gap is the difference between what the student is expected to learn or be doing. So, those are the stated learning outcomes, which is the desired result. And the academic progress that a child has achieved, that is the current result. If you have a look at the visual, then you will see that... Uh, the child is hanging somewhere here and you have the current levels that is where the child is now and this is the desired level that is where the child should have actually been which means now that there is a gap in learning that's a learning gap so the learning gap that we are talking about can be represented on a sequence from minor to major so if you look very carefully here, you have C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6. Now, all these, right, from C1 to C6 are small little fragments of content. They are pieces of content. And in between the content, you will see the small yellow color blocks. Now, these yellow color blocks represent the learning gaps. So, if you see between C1 and C2, there is a small gap. Similarly, between C3 and C4. Whereas between C4 and C5, the gaps are larger. That means that the gaps, the learning gaps can be small and they can also be large. 
So a minor learning gap could be as simple as failure to acquire a specific skill. Say for example, failure to read a given picture. Now this is a given picture and the child is unable to read, interpret what the picture has to tell him or her. Or failure to make a connection between heavy and light in relation to water. Something that is heavier, will it float on water or sink in water? Something that is light in relation to water, will it sink or float in water? How seeds are dispersed? Inability to grasp a story or understand a comic strip. For example, in class 3, there is a story about Chotu's house. Two major learning gaps shown by extremely poor academic performance. So whatever the outcome, there is a need to find out where the difficulty lies. So here the tact of the teacher comes into existence. So the difficulty could lie in the learner's inability to comprehend or understand the language in which the content is presented. Sometimes language is a major factor that leads to learning gaps. Transcode information. And when I say transcode information, I mean converting information from one form to another. So from text to pictures. For example, if a teacher says, I want you to diagram um, the diagram a squirrel. So the child has to draw a squirrel. Or for that matter, if a, uh, if a teacher says, I want you to, to diagram a relationship that you share between you and your parents. So the next one is use basic concepts. Uh, concepts as they are not clear. So basic concepts of children not being clear. Sometimes they may not be able to understand the meaning of terms. For example, hemoglobin, anemia, uninvited animals at your place. So you have lizards or you may have rats. So these are uninvited animals at your place. But a child may not be able to comprehend the meaning of uninvited animals at your place. Sometimes the child may not be attentive due to lack of attitude. Lack of motivation, which are again very important factors. Uh, the child may have a difficulty because of inappropriate learning experiences that are created by the teacher. So there can be a variety of reasons as to why a child may face a difficulty. So the focus now is on investigating where the difficulty lies. Or in other words, the specific difficulties or the specific weaknesses that the learner encounters or what the learner knows so that correction can occur and the child can enjoy learning. So what is an investigative test? Let us take an example. Flying high. This is in class 3. So it talks about different birds that live in water, in trees, that birds that eat different kinds of food have different sizes and shapes, different colors, have different beaks, beaks which are of different shapes and sizes. So an investigative test, which is also known as a diagnostic test, is designed to determine what does the child know or what does the learner know about the concepts, skills in this particular area. And the area is flying high. What does he know about birds? Then, what is a student's learning style or preference of learning? Would you like to see visuals of different birds? Or would you like to see real birds? So that's a learning style. Would you like to sit in class? Or would you like to be out of class? Would you like to discuss with his, with his peers? Or would you like to be a part of a larger classroom? So how well can the student perform certain skills related to a particular unit. We know that no two learners learn the same and perform in the same way. Learners are different. So, investigative test or diagnostic tests therefore are administered individually. However, they may also be administered in groups. So, an investigative test would collect data about an individual student or students, subject it to analysis and arrive at some corrective measures known as academic scaffolding or handholding. 
Academic scaffolding or handholding is nothing but academic supports to help a learner to tide over the learning gaps, to tide over the difficulties that he or she is facing. So it helps a child to overcome the difficulties that he or she is facing in the whole process of learning. Thus we can say that investigative tests, they help a teacher to know if differentiated instruction is needed. When I say differentiated instruction, I mean trying to modify instruction, trying to make it more individualized. So whether modification in teaching or learning is required, so the teacher can make use of the learner's own strengths also to set personal learning goals for the student. So now the question before us is, when are these investigative tests to be conducted? Are they to be conducted as instruction takes place? Are they to be conducted before instruction takes place? Are they to be conducted at the end of instruction? When are they to be conducted? Well, they can be conducted anytime. Preferably at the start of the year to know the specific difficulties children have. So it is always nice to have an investigative test or a simple diagnostic test that is conducted at the start of the year. This gives us a lot of information, a lot of ideas about where the children are. Have they achieved the minimum levels that they are supposed to be acquiring to be in the new class? Or it can also be done during instruction. So the age-old adage I quote, a stitch in time saves nine, is very apt or it's appropriate when we look at the relationship between learner achievement and investigative test. So there is a close association between learner achievement and investigative test. So an investigative test that is administered at the start of the year can guide the teacher in meticulously writing the learning outcomes. So the learning outcomes can be, can be written very systematically, very meticulously, can plan a variety of student-friendly learning strategies. Again, when I say student-friendly learning strategies, there are so many strategies. For instance, you can have, uh, you can have children learning in the outside, outside the classroom. You can make use of several digital media. You can use realia, that is real things in learning. You can make use of games. You can make use of dance. You can make use of simulations. You can make use of small group discussions. You can make use of cooperative learning structures, simple cooperative learning structures like think, pay, share. So the teacher can plan a variety of, of learner-friendly strategies, gather a variety of stimulating learning materials and media, and accordingly plan the learning experiences for a particular unit or a particular topic that the teacher intends to expose the learners to. So at intervals during the learning process, investigative test or diagnostic test as they are known, help the teacher and the student to know how learning is progressing. It's very important to know how learning is progressing. So what you see here is basically a graph and it is known as a learning curve. So if you look very carefully here at this point, you see that learning progresses, it progresses, it starts peaking. And then if you look carefully, the curve is slowly decreasing, it's diminishing, diminishing, it's coming down, down, down and down. So what does this tell us? This learning curve communicates a lot of meaning. It tells us that a learner was progressing tremendously. He reached a peak and then suddenly his performance started dropping and dropping. It started declining. So what is the reason? And investigative test can help us to understand as to why such a thing happens. Then we also have the year-end diagnostic test, which is conducted towards the end of the year and which provides an assessment of the student's learning for the whole year. So the entire year's learning can also be 
determined by using a year-end diagnostic test. Now, this will also help the teacher to guide progress when the child goes to the next class or to the next higher grade. So learners, do you now see that investigative tests are powerful instruments which are in the hands of a teacher and which can be used judiciously to know how well a child is making progress to identify learning gaps and to rectify and remedy. Now, there are different types of investigative or diagnostic test. Learners, you need to you need to remember that there are no standardized investigative or diagnostic test in EVS. So what does this mean? This means that teachers will have to construct their own tests which are known as instructor created tests to be used as diagnostic tools to determine students level of knowledge. So diagnostic test or investigative test can be in different formats. The first one is known as the written test. So such a test is prepared by, by writing a detailed or an exhaustive list of test items under a single teaching point. So you have, you take a particular concept or maybe a set of concepts and you go on writing as many questions as you can in relation to that particular teaching point or concept or set of concepts. So these test items address every single aspect of the concept and you need to remember this. Let me cite an example for you. Uh, this is about uh, snakes that they learn in class 5. So I have taken just 5 items. I could have taken more but I have taken just 5 items. So the first one is poisonous teeth are known as fangs. It's yes or no. So the child has to mark whether it's yes or no. The second one is snakes here through ears. You have to find out whether snakes have ears or not. So the learner will either mark it as yes or no. The third one is snakes die after some time if their fangs and poison glands are removed. If it is yes, they would mark it as yes. If it's no, they would mark it as no. Home remedy can be given to a person who is bitten by a non-poisonous snake. So a child can answer this question if he knows the difference between a bite of a poisonous snake and a non-poisonous snake. So he has to write the answer as yes or no. And poisonous snakes can be milked for their venom. Uh, when I say milked for their venom, I mean the venom can be extracted. All right, Milked is extraction of venom. So yes or no. So these are five items on that particular piece of content. So if a child gives the incorrect answer for all these questions, it means that there is a major learning gap in his learning. It means that something has gone wrong somewhere in the process of learning. At times it could also be possible that the teacher failed to present this information in a system or in an order that the child could understand. Very often uh, children, uh, they, they get confused with teeth and fangs. Are they the same? Are they different? Are fangs teeth and are teeth fangs? So, Children have lot many questions. If they have been able to answer all these five questions correctly, it means that they have achieved the objectives of instruction. So they have achieved the learning outcomes. The next type of uh, a diagnostic test that can be used by teachers is, uh, is known as the two-tier multiple choice question. The two tier. Now it's called a two tier because there are two tiers. So you have a tier one and you have a tier two. 
please look at the spelling. It's T I E R. It's not tire, it's tier. It's, so you have two tiers a tier one and a tier two. So they are somewhat similar to our traditional multiple choice questions. But as the very name suggests, they contain a second tier of questioning associated with the first question. Now these two tier questions have been used in education for decades and sometimes they are referred to as uh, assertion reason questions. Sometimes some people also call these as the permutational questions. They are similar to the traditional multiple choice questions. Two tier MCQs are classified into the genre of test known as objective test. Now it is believed that this style of questioning first appeared in uh, the United Kingdom. But if you trace it, it actually started in the United States of America. So the first tier of the question usually contains a knowledge statement and the second tier of the question facilitates a testing of the student's learning beyond recall and into the higher levels of thinking. So, in here also, we have the key that is the correct answer and the distractors, that is a list of options given to distract the learner from the key or the correct answer. So, let me present uh, an illustration. So, Ratsan and Patanjali are uh, two good friends and they are in the kitchen. They are playing with two balls made of the same material but of different sizes. So Russell puts the smallest ball in the bucket of water and he watches it float. Now what does Patanjali do? Patanjali removes the small ball that Russell had put inside the bucket and puts the large ball into the bucket of water. Now this is the tier one question. What do you think will happen when Patanjali puts the large ball into the bucket of water? So there are three situations that are presented, A, B and C. So you have the bucket of, you have the A bucket, the B bucket and the C bucket. So circle the picture that you think best represents what will happen to the large ball when it is put in the bucket of water. So the child has to encircle and the tier 2 question is concerned with this happens. Because the large ball A is hollow, so it will float. If you recall, the A bucket B weighs more than the small ball and therefore it sinks. If you recall the previous uh, uh, images, C is heavy but not heavy enough to reach the bottom. So if a child has encircled A, then what is given for A is his understanding. If he encircles B, then B is his understanding. If we encircle C, then C is his understanding. We can also make use of concept maps, which are also known as mind maps. And we can also have one-on-one -on -one interviews wherein you ask a series of questions to a learner and the learner will present answers based on the questions that you present. So, this particular session has dealt with the idea of investigative test and how as teachers we can construct investigative test. Now as teachers I want you to remember that to construct investigative or diagnostic test is not so simple. It is not so easy. It requires a lot of practice. It requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of reasoning and this can be done conveniently when you start partnering with your other teachers, your other uh, teacher fellows in school. Thank you.